So I, I, I had a teacher, and he always used to say, subtle is significant in practice. And tonight, I want to talk about some subtle energies that are necessary uh, to be cultivated uh, if we're going to actually have a transformative experience with our, with our practice. And so it's the role of ease and acceptance and how they work, work together um, to support us and reinforce us. When you hear the words ease and acceptance, you might think, well, acceptance, that's kind of weak. Ease, that's got a kind of a weakness. But they're actually, when they're cultivated, they're indispensable, powerful forces um, in a contemplative practice. In any contemplative practice, you know, we're a Buddhist organiz organization, so you're getting that framework. But ease and acceptance, um, I think you'll find it in any of the contemplative practices. And so a meditative state is very simple in, in one form. It's the combination of the mental factors of calm or tranquility or ease, like a little bundle of those mental factors, and uh, the factors of um, alertness and energy. And together, that kind of tranquil alertness is a meditative state. And it happens naturally. Everyone, or most humans, unless they're under ungodly pressure all the time, um, have moments where there is this kind of calm that comes over. There's a crisp alertness. It's, you know, people call it the zone. Athletes, musicians, artists talk about it. Um, but a meditation practice um, cultivates the uh, capacity to fall into that more and more of the time and such that a really mature, developed practice has many, many, many moments and it becomes like a default resting area. So that's where, that's where you're headed with, uh, with this practice. So you'll also notice if there's um, an alertness without any calm, that can tend to kind of move towards anxiety, agitation. You know, if there's no calm, you just get wound up, and more and more wound up. Um, and then, as we all know, that makes us sick in body, mind, heart, etc. when that becomes acute. Um, you know, we feel that in, in those moments when we're, when, when we're moving in that direction, there's a kind of contraction of the body and the mind. We can feel it in the body. And our capacity for uh, uh, having a wide perspective becomes narrow. There's less spaciousness in the mind. Creativity has escaped us. We're tight, you know, like in a vice. And in as it becomes more acute, we get flooded with more and more cortisol, adrenaline, epinephrine, you know, all the little hormones that uh, run us down. So, on the other hand, if you have a deep calm without any alertness, then there's just a kind of fuzzy, dreamy, lethargic dullness. And so, Contemplative practice is finding that sweet spot where there's a nice ben a balance of those mental factors. So there's calm and tranquil, there's calm and tranquility and ease. But it's energetic enough. There's enough energy in the system that the heart and mind is really bright and awake. There's that really healthy level of alertness. But my my experience as a teacher 
uh, over these decades um, in this culture is that most people struggle with the anxiety part of it, not able to access the calm and tranquility. Um, um, that that's, those are the predominant cases. It's, um, uh, and the struggle for alertness is uh, a, a lesser factor. And actually it's somewhat easier to work with. Um, but as a long-term uh, contemplative, you're going to have periods of both. Where there's a, this kind of energetic alertness, there's not much calm, and it's kind of like a Ugh, experience. And then there'll be the times of sleepiness and kind of torpor is the, is the, the word in Buddhism. So, so I'm, I want to look first at uh, some of the factors that cultivate calm and we'll actually do, we'll do a few exercises. Um, so in those moments when you awake that there's unease in the system, dis ease um, you know when that's active that recognition is the starting place if there's not the recognition um, you're just simply tumbled along in uh, in reactivity with a mind that's proliferating wildly from one thought to another and um, things are just getting tighter and tighter so as a contemplative, a person paying attention to your inner experience, you notice that there's this constellation of contraction happening. That's the first step. So, so what do you do? So what's next? You know, we, we, we teach in the Buddha taught, okay, you want to feel it directly. Turn your attention towards it in the body. You know, what's going on in the body? What's going on in the chest, the extremities, the blood moving? You know, what are you noticing? And, has the, and are you noticing that the mind has run off in some catastrophic runaway, you know? So, in, in teaching, we often mention the, uh, what's known as the second arrow. Now, the first arrow, is just, we get wounded by the first arrow just by being born. You're going to have a whole series of events that wound you in one way or another. Losses, illness, you're going to, you know, you know, fall down. You know, tonight's going to be an icy night or tomorrow's going to be an icy day. You know, and I imagine my, you know, remember, bridges freeze before roadways and so do decks and places like that. But we've all seen that sign. <clears throat> so I know on my deck, which somehow sagging just a little bit so the, the steps are no longer tilted the way they should be. They're just a little on the slide. And if I'm going out there and I, every morning I go out and put bird seed around and stuff, it's easy to just woo, just go flying. Um, so imagine, you know, you're out somewhere, you fall down. It's not hard to do, you know. So that's the first arrow. That's just what happens in life. And you get a bruise or you break a bone, and you know, whatever it is, that's the deal. Now, that's where the, that's where the mind then comes in. And you get hit with the second arrow and third and fourth and fifth if you're not watching what's going on. You know, so you fall down, and then the mind takes over. Oh, damn, it's probably broken, you know. The, 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 the sensation is, is, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's an 11. You know, it must be, it must be broken, you know. And now I'm going to have to go to the hospital. And this could end up in some permanent disability. I know things go wrong in the hospital, I've had friends where it's, it seemed like a simple thing and then it wasn't so simple and it was complex and that could happen to me and my life will be changed forever. And, and what about and it's sepsis? I just read an article about sepsis. You walk through the door of any hospital and you might get sepsis and they're doing their best to keep it out but it's in every hospital or it seems to be and when I go there to get my whatever, 
um, and that could destroy me or kill me or, and live with that disability and I won't be able to work and, and then I'll be, end up under some overpass as a kind of invalid, destitute and alone. But really you just fell, fell down and you don't know anything other than it hurts. So all those other arrows, that's the proliferation of the mind and what the Buddha talked about as the second arrow. That's where we actually have some control over the situation if we're, if we're awake to what's going on. If we're not awake, the mind just goes and goes and goes and then we're, not only do we have a bruise or, or whatever, but we just tangled ourselves in a knot. So the mindfulness practice that you're learning catches that with the Pali word is papancha, earlier in the process. It's like, oh, look at what my mind's doing. I'm just, I'm like a pincushion with arrows now, a whole quiver of arrows I've just done, you know? But I'm gonna stop that, you know? So, how do we stop that? Or what's a way to stop that? It's, um, you've, you've, you've seen the runaway mind, um, and so what you might do is consider some grounding uh, exercises. Really simply kind of pulling the mind back from that runaway thought train that only ends up in catastrophe and disaster. And so I thought we'd for the next two minutes or three minutes run through just a couple of those. It's kind of like a first aid treatment uh, for, for a runaway mind. And, and one of the things to do, uh, when the mind has started running away, the body is tightening. So to just begin to move every joint that you can. Start with your fingers and move your fingers. And then just move your elbows. Do it, do it now. You don't have to s stand up or anything. You can if you want. And then kind of move your hips around. Get, get some motion in your hips. Move your back. Move your neck gently. Just finding every place that is supposed to bend and see if you can bend it. Your knees. You know, your toes. Just to kind of open up, open up the channels. You know, so that's a, that's a beginning step. Another, another step, and first responders and um, military people use a very simple breathing technique. There's several of them out there uh, to, to immediately kind of bring the body down. And what we're doing is, with and manipulating the breath, um, we're moving from the sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the part of our system that responds to threat or perceived threat. And it's a hair trigger it goes off in a moment. And that's the kind of building of stress and anxiety. And it's great for survival. It is, but if it's overcooked, it makes us sick. The parasympathetic nervous system is our natural relaxation response. And that needs all the support we can give it. We live in a culture that is like faster and faster and more and more pressure and um, that's kind of supporting the parasympathetic nervous system is a big part of our practice. That's why when we're doing formal practice, it's great. Okay, the mind runs away. You just come back and re-relax. You know, notice what it's like to be awake again and re-relax and re-relax. The more we do that consciously, the stronger that part of the nervous system gets. And so it, manipulating the breath in an acute situation can be very helpful. And that's why first responders going into a situation uh, or military people about to do something really challenging and threatening um, will use uh, some breathing techniques. And it's there's, there's widespread now. And so the one that we'll do now together is very simple. We'll just take a, a little bit longer inhale. We'll count to four. Hold it for a moment and then an exhale in a count of four. And we'll do that for a minute or so and I'll, I'll try to count it out a little bit. So just finding your position, close your eyes a little bit and take a nice big inhale. One, two, 
two, three, four, hold, exhale, one, two, three, four, hold, inhale, one, two, three, four, hold, exhale, one, two, three, four. Now continue yourself at your own pace. Nice full inhales, holding for a second, counting and then exhaling, counting. You want to extend it to five, feel free. Okay, one more round of deep breath. One, two, three, four. Hold. Release slowly. Okay. So how was that? A little change, maybe? You know, so breath control is kind of like, we can see it as a bridge from the sympathetic nervous system pumping away to a little more relaxed. Get the parasympathetic system that, to know that it's time to come online a little bit. Um, another of my favorite grounding exercises, uh, we'll do this for a, a few minutes, um, uh, is the contact with the environment meditation. And uh, that's a very simple one also. So with your feet on the floor, your hands resting anywhere, your lap, etc., eyes closed. It's, it's a matter of just uh, moving through some contact points. And you can make up your own. You can do this lying in bed if you're going to sleep or not being able to go to sleep. Um, so uh, right now just feel where the chair is touching your body. That's a point of contact. Ch chair is part of our environment where con our body is contacting with it. You might feel it in your buttocks or your hamstrings. Maybe your back is against it. Just noticing that contact. And now bring attention to the contact of your feet on the floor and in your shoes. Very simple. And now bringing the contact to your hands wherever they're resting, on your lap or together, maybe they're folded. Just notice what parts of your hand are in contact with something else, your hands, and what is not. And a more subtle contact now is the touch of clothing. You'll notice some places you can feel it, other places, well, no. So just explore the touch of clothing. And finally, the very subtle touch of air on exposed skin.
And so let's do another round together, bringing attention to the contact of the chair. Where do you, is there places that you might not have noticed last time that you do now? Just bringing your attention there. Is there pressure? Is there heat? Is there movement? Vibration? And now attention to the feet. Is a certain part of your foot having a greater connection or touch with the floor than other? What do you feel in terms of the toes and their contact? Just exploring with interest. And then bring attention to your hands. Where they're resting, how they're touching each other if they are. And now your clothing again. Is there any new places you can discover of the touch of your clothing? And now the air on exposed skin. Can you feel the air touching your ears or inside your ears? And what about moving through your scalp? Just explore. And now do one round at your own pace. The chair, the feet, the hands, the clothes, and the air. Taking your time. Okay, so those are very simple grounding exercises. They're incorporated in most of the stress reduction programs and, they're, and they work and they're beneficial. But a contemplative practice has a lot more. And, um, and as a student of meditation, you're constantly building other kind of supportive energies and perspectives to create a greater uh, tranquility and to bring about acceptance. And one of the main things that the Buddha taught for 45 years was to have his students pay attention to change, both internally and externally. Get to know nature as it is not as you wish it to be, but as it is. And the fundamental aspect of nature is change. It's never the same. It's always moving. We're always moving. We've had a million thoughts today. We've had a million emotions. We've had all kinds of different body sensations. You know, change, change, this kind of bubbling change. And so, uh, he was asking the students to like, pay attention to that. Because what will happen over time, if you're paying attention to it both internally and externally, the seasons, the weather, you know, everything external, um, that there, it begins to move from, yeah, everybody knows everything is changing. That's intellectual. It's really not an argument there. And on the atomic level and on the greater kind of cosmic level, everything's moving. 
But when we practice it and experience it, both our internal landscape changing and moving and externally, we begin to kind of pick up the sensibility on a visceral level, which is different than, of course, I know everything changes. There's a visceral change. And in that visceral change, allows us to be more in line with nature and not fight it so much. We fight it, of course, when we have something that's pleasant or we want or we want it to stick around, we grasp on, we fight, we fight, and then it doesn't stick around and it changes and we suffer. And the same with things we don't like. We thrash and kick and push and whine and whatever we do, um, and it changes. You know, that's the benefit. Whatever we don't like is going to change also. Um, so it's kind of getting in with nature as opposed to all the time opposing it. So the, the, that's a core teaching that the, you know, the Buddha stressed for all those years. But it's only available through practice to that visceral nature. Otherwise it just stays intellectual. And then we freak out, you know, to a great degree when we don't get what we want or we get something we don't want. So it's that practicing, oh, watch that change, you know? Hey, just take out, take all the photographs of yourself throughout your life and take a look and go, oh my God, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, but it did and it's gonna continue, and, you know? So. So. This view, this perspective around change, it, ma it matures and it develops. And there's the um, subtleties in practice that you begin to, to notice. Um, there are these, uh, it just comes with being human. There are these survival energies that are with us all the time. You know, there's the wanting and there's the worry and there's the the restlessness and there's the aversion to certain things and there's doubt and there's sleepiness. These are all classic uh, energies that the Buddha talked about, but they're part of being human. They're not the enemy. Uh, but when, when, and they're all designed to bring us comfort, to uh, make us safe, uh, to have us never feel pain and for us to live forever. You know, that's kind of what they're doing. But the energies of planning and worry, which they're real design, they're trying to help us. It makes, it, if we follow it out, it makes us sick. So it's like, thank you very much. I appreciate, you know, the organism for trying to do all these things or for wanting more and more things that there's some kind of security that's going to happen or pushing away anything that's unpleasant. I mean, it's a whole kind of, talk and exploration, but it's part of our recognition when we sit down to meditate if those energies are up. And they're not our enemy. It's just, it's just our humanness. Um, you know, when I, when I sit down to practice, you know, who knows what the, what the formal practice is going to be like? I never know. I could sit down and it's can be pretty calm and I'm with the breath and things open up and blah. And then other times, many times, there'll be parts during that time that I'm sitting down where I'll be visited by some strong energy, some emotion. Or I'll notice, oh my God, I've just been planning and planning. Well, what's the emotion behind that? And I look a little deeper. Oh, there's fear. You know, I'm planning to kind of set things right and and, I, and then it's oh it's, look at that that's that survival energy bubbling up through me just like every other human that's ever lived um, way back all our ancestors you know those kind of energies but there's something about the recognition that it's happening in that moment that kind of cuts the power a little bit of it it's like oh I see you I get it it's okay you know and then as a contemplative artist, and this is an art, it's not a science, as a contemplative artist, you know, you're watching it, it still has some power, it does its thing like everything in creation. 
you notice it, it's been flowering, it's been happening, you're watching it, you're feeling it, and then it kind of dissipates down. And at some point you say, well, I'm not, I don't need to pay attention to that anymore. I'm just going to go back and rest with the breath or body sensations or sounds or whatever. And then you're just kind of resting and all those energies are quiet for a while. And then something else, something else might bubble up. There may be some grief, you know, or maybe there's some joy, you know, and you notice that in the same way with the same equanimity. That's what we do in our practice. You know, everything's going through its cycle. So, uh, there's no bad meditation. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. It's the meditation you don't do. It's the bad one. But if you sit and you watch your internal world coming and going, changing, you're developing confidence. You know, the confidence that, oh, I can be with grief directly, fully, or I can be with sadness or fear or whatever. And there's kind of this growing confidence over time that practitioners experience that, oh, yeah, I've been practicing for five years or ten years and I used to be all freaked out by this. and uh, I'm not so freaked out about that anymore, but I am still freaked out about this. So it's like a process that eventually everything is able to be metabolized, all experiences, physical and emotional. That's where a contemplative practice is headed, that we can be with what happens with grace and equanimity. And it takes practice. So, um, that kindly receptivity, that's an acceptance. That's the acceptance part that's, that's in with cultivating the ease. And so we, we have these techniques, these emergency uh, techniques to ground ourselves when we need it. Uh, and they're beautiful and effective. And then there's this whole underneath, it's kind of like an iceberg, underneath is all this exploration of this amazing, miraculous life and all the changes internally and externally which support the ease. And when we get with nature, we're just naturally going to be more accepting. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't exercise our vigor in our, with intensity to change things that ought to be changed in ourselves and in the world. It's not like, hey, let's all practice and become doormats. That's not it. You know? We're developing this calm, this stable, tranquil, um, equanimity and acceptance for what is out of which springs in, out of when you're feeling like that at, there's more capacity to creativity more capacity for energy to do things you know and part of this practice is to alleviate suffering that's the Buddha's deal internally and externally where we see it in ourselves how do we work with it how do we learn to let go and when we see it externally, what do we do? The bodhisattva path. You know, I vow to relieve the suffering of all sentient beings, you know. That's a big task. And, you know, you don't have to look too far to see suffering elsewhere where we can apply ourselves. And we're going to be better at that exercise if we have that kind of stability of tranquility, calm and acceptance for what it is, we can better change what needs to be changed. Um, so, I think that's all I have to say for tonight. Um, enjoy the changing weather. Um, be careful. Until next time.